Hey there, everyone. Um, my name is Hien. Um, I go uh, by she, her pronouns, and I work with Asian Prisoner Support Committee um, as an organizer and as a program coordinator. Uh, my primary focus areas are um, in prison programming, where I help support our ethnic studies program um, inside of San Quentin and remotely and anti-deportation campaigns and strategies. Um, and broadly, our organization um, aims to support um, currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, and deported community members. So the first question I have is, Hien, for you personally, what was your journey like and to become, a, to become a civically engaged? I think I became one of those kids that was uh, in the right place, in the right time, uh, to be quite honest with you all. Um, I think... I came into, uh, I was actually a really angsty young teenager. Um, I felt really harmed by the world. Um, I felt like my community was heavily harmed by um, state violence and I felt that within my own family. Um, and I didn't know how to express that. It wasn't up until actually I got um, mentored by a whole bunch of college students um, at UC Berkeley. Um, they taught me a lot of political education a lot about um, you know, what it means to be Southeast Asian American, um, the politics behind it, um, which politicized me pretty heavily. And uh, I think ever since then, I pretty much been politicized um, and studying um, and re-studying um, what I know about the world. And so I think, yeah, I, I just became a really lucky person. I became mentored by really, um, you know, caring and nurturing college students who then nurtured me into college, who then now nurture me into my professional career as an organizer. For my next question is, um, in your opinion, how, how is anti-deportation work tied to racial justice movement, including abolition and calls to defund the police? Yeah, I think um, we often don't think about immigration in um, the same scope as um, criminalization, right? Because we always think about um, criminalization or um, kind of on this binary or even immigration on this kind of binary. What is a good immigrant and what is a bad immigrant? Um, and so I think in regards to your question, um, anti-deportation work is part of this movement to defund the police, um, to seek racial justice, um, that includes the call to abolition uh, in lots of ways, right? If we know that criminalization is a process and that criminalization um, needs to have very specific conditions, right? Like poverty, um, under-resourced communities, um, unhoused people, um, you know, a situation and condition where um, there are several health risks, then those are perfect breeding grounds for criminalization, right? So if you can be criminalized under these conditions, um, then that is like something that you can be incarcerated for. Um, and so in our time, uh, we run a program at San Quentin uh, State Prison where we meet a lot of Southeast Asian refugees um, who you know, came to the United States in the early 80s and 90s, um, seeking for a better life. Um, and unfortunately, they were put into these conditions um, and where they had to um, go through survival, um, they had to survive. Um, and survival for them meant joining gangs, um, learning how to pick up violence as a mechanism for their survival. Um, and kind of resulted in um, you know, them encountering the carceral um, system, encountering police um, and living in highly policed areas uh, where you know, California was going through or even the United States was going through a prison boom. Um, and so we can't really detach those two because um, immigrants um, live in these areas as well. And especially, um, if we're talking about racial justice, uh, Black immigrants get um, deported at higher rates. Um, I think 22% of 
deportation proceedings are um, to black immigrants. And so I think with that said, um, you know, it's a pipeline that we're talking about and how do we disrupt this pipeline from um, being criminalized as a young person um, to when you get out of prison, turned over to ICE to hopefully not um, getting deported. Um, and that is the call, right? The call is that we dis we're disrupting these pieces that prevent people um, from being with their families. Uh, it sounds like amazing work to do and especially with try uh, hard times. Um, of course, there's been recent stories about actually deportation um, recently along the uh, southern border. And I also kind of mentioned, um, I don't want to go too off topic, but being able to kind of um, you mentioned criminalizations and property in that way. Um, my aunt, she is a defense attorney back in Louisiana, and she does not only help like get a, uh, reductions in their crime, but also she helps find ways to help them to make sure that even afterwards they can find ways to, you know, be able to be back in life without having to worry about being arrested again, without having to worry about uh, being criminalized again. So. It, 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 it's a lot, and honestly, I'm kind of, kind of glad that she exposed me to the, uh, uh, with the criminalization and the racial justice that goes on even before I uh, um, came yeah. forward with NASA. Yeah, I think you're touching on um, a really important part about, you know, what it means when we say abolition, right? Like, it's not just about diminishing places, but it's about creating spaces of care and healing um, and love. Um, and that's ultimately what it's about, right? Where we're talking about disrupting a system that doesn't allow us to feel that, to be able to have access to these things that are necessary for growing and healing. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for bringing that and sharing that. Thank you. She, uh, like I said, she does amazing work. So I'll have to speak with her after this as well. So. My next question is, uh, what happens to those who get deported? Uh, are they able to stay in touch? Uh, are you able, sorry, are you able to stay in touch with them? Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag, um, depending on what population. Um, the Cambodian population, um, historically for us, has been heavily impacted by deportations. Um, and given kind of the conditions of um, how and the frequency of their deport deportation, there's actually a, a huge community of deportees um, starting up their own you know, businesses, their own re-entry groups in Cambodia. So these groups are a little bit easier to reach as a whole. Um, so we're in contact with some of those groups. And in fact, um, back in 2019, um, APSC as well as some stakeholders actually traveled to Cambodia for a listening tour where we did um, clinics uh, um, to, I think, be able to talk through, you know, when someone is deported, um, our job doesn't end, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're fighting until we, we can figure things out. We're fighting until um, people are okay. Um, and, you know, what we're finding is that um, it's hard. Um, you know, everything about re-entry is totally disrupted. When you're incarcerated, uh, especially if you're um, someone who's served a life sentence, especially if you're someone who's like served a life sentence since you were 14 or 15, um, you pretty much work to parole out of prison um, and to be able to see your family um, with jobs lined up, re-entry plans lined up here in the United States. But um, you also have to plan a reentry plan for if you get deported, and that's really difficult um, to do. And in fact, um, you know, it's so arbitrary that you know courts will just take an arbitrary letter of any sorts. But um, you know, to get out of a CDCR prison, you need like hundreds of paperwork to prove that you're ready to go out. But um, if it's for an immigration court, you just you know, you barely need any papers. And so it, I can tell you like um, those who do get deported um, are living under rough conditions just on the re-entry front. Um, most of them fled as kids. Um, so they probably don't know the language. 
um, most of their families are probably in the United States and most of their, you know, mothers or fathers are probably elderly. And especially during a pandemic where pretty much most of other Southeast Asian countries are in lockdowns now, it's been pretty hard to get jobs, um, to even think about what re-entry looks like now. Um, so in short, we do stay in touch with who we can. Um, you know, we keep in touch with folks in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in China. Um, um, but yeah, I, uh, it's, it's hard for folks um, who are deported right now. The next question I have is that are there people you are fighting for right now? And if so, can you share their stories with us? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a small org, um, but there are so many different people that we're fighting for right now. Um, one in particular person that we're currently running a campaign for is um, Fee Pham, who is a young person um, who was born and raised out of the Bay Area. Uh, his family's from, um, and he actually was uh, coming out of, paroled out of um, Folsom State Prison um, a couple of months ago. Um, but unfortunately, because he was born in a refugee camp, um, he was transferred immediately over to ICE. Uh, Fee was a firefighter. Um, he responded to a lot of the fire um, fires that were starting out. And so kind of at the start of fire season, um, Fee was uh, responding to kind of medical emergencies of peers, to CDCR staff. Um, and you know, like anyone else, um, Fee's being defined by a mistake he made as a young person um, and not seeing um, the, and not, you know, being recognized by the whole story of his life or the conditions that he was brought up in or even the rehabilitation that he has gone through um, to get to where he's at. Um, and so right now he uh, was transferred into an ICE detention center in Colorado which was thousands of miles away from California, um, separated from his family. And so right now we're actually calling um, the governor to pardon him so that he can come back to his elderly mother um, who is um, facing health issues right now. Um, B is also facing health issues. He actually got COVID inside of um, Folsom and uh, the prison actually didn't let him know that he had some uh, lung damage. Um, and he is also having problems with his vision. Um, and basically he can't see a doctor um, until he's like near dying. So um, ICE is cruel and um, we're really trying to get the out right now. And so now that Governor Newsom is not recalled, um, please, you know, send Governor Newsom an email um, to, to ask him to pardon fee. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, again, APSC is just an extension to a lot of different groups. And so I just want to uplift some other things that um, we are a part of. So Pardons for the People is a small campaign, is a campaign and a list of impacted people that are also looking for pardons from the governor's office. Um, An Wing is um, a brother from SoCal um, who's also looking for um, a governor's pardon. He's been out, but um, he's been out for about two years and he was actually detained twice in ICE. Um, right now he's currently on house arrest and he basically can't do anything. Um, you know, he's basically trapped in his home. Um, he can only go to work. Um, and so that's just a terrible thing, a situation to be in. Um, Ricky Chuan, um, for folks who are in the Pennsylvania area or actually just anyone in anywhere um, is also looking for a pardon in the Pennsylvania area. And so there's a link to his, um, an episode from pbs.org um, to learn more about um, his case. Um, and then there's a small script that if you wanna call, um, the governor of Pennsylvania, you can. Um, and so there's a lot out there. There's probably, you know, 10 more people that I can mention, but these are kind of the kind of the immediate relationships um, that APSC has. 
Oh, I do have a question to come up uh, asked that was brought from the audience. And the question goes, when during your line of work and activism to help the incarcerated, those detained by ICE and deportees, how do you dispel the st stigma and stereotypes against prisoners from other communities or people who may not understand the struggles or injustice or feel uncomfortable by it? Yeah. Um, I think my immediate question is that it doesn't stop me from doing my work. <laughs> um, and, and I think if I took it, if I took this question into um, the lens of like, if this is like my family member, um, what do I tell my family members who don't agree with the work that I do? Um, I think it's, it's, stepping stones. Um, and I think I, I can't hold the expectation that, um, you know, people who hold a lot of trauma, who are looking for ways to protect themselves might not immediately understand. Um, understand. And so um, I think, again, it's all about healing and how do we come from a healing framework and center that um, so that we're all meeting each other somewhere in the middle. Um, and so if I was talking to a family member, um, and this is often comes up where I'm talking to a family member, um, where it's just like, you're, you're working with a criminal or you're working with someone who's like done harm. Like, why do you do that? Um, well, it's, you know, it's asking myself the questions like if I've done harm, you know, do you dispose of me? Um, like, do you love me enough to like, take me in to like know to let me know what I'm doing wrong and I think that's kind of the question right like how do we come to um uh, how, how do we come to healing and solutions without um being punitive um and I think that takes time um but by no means does this stop me from doing uh doing what I do um and I think like it, it takes a lot of conviction because it is really hard Right, but um, I also think that sometimes it does. It's not worth explaining to people who don't want to know. <laughs> I think that's the sad truth. But I think um, I think my hopeful my hopeful answer to that is that um, I think we all need to heal, um, and we all and maybe folks just have trauma um, that you know they get they have to go through. And so I think if we acknowledge that. Um, we're working towards more understanding, um, more common ground. And yes, I uh, to completely agree. I mean, it's something that just takes time and you know, there's, there is trauma to it, but you know, only, only thing they can do is that is, only thing they can help us that is just healing and taking the time to do so, right? I kind of want to, okay, uh, I want to say, I think that we'll, I want to thank the audience for that question. Um, the next question is, uh, are there any policy changes that can be made to address uh, the issues? Yeah, uh, right now APSC is a co-sponsor of a um, bill in California called the Vision Act, called AB, 9, AB 937, um, the Vision Act. Um, and it basically aims to um, prevent CDCR, which is our state prison system and our local jails to hand people over to ICE after they've earned release. Um, unfortunately, it was made a two year bill um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, but it is an important policy change um, about, I think, uh, last year during the pandemic, we found that almost a third of people who were sitting in California ICE detention centers were people who were directly transferred from um, prisons or jails. Um, so what that tells us is that, um, you know, most people who are directly impacted are people who are currently incarcerated in, in some form or um, people who are, have gone been in contact with some um, some type of law enforcement right because there's a, a system that can track you um, whether it be your parole agent whether it be 
your local jail, your county sheriff, CHP, these, these different entities have a way to communicate um, and track, um, track, unfortunately, people and be able to discriminate someone based off of their conviction. Um, ICE will determine that anyone with a conviction, you know, is a deportable person. Um, and we think that that's terrible. Uh, well, one, because, you know, um, it's hard to get out of prison, um, just in general. Uh, California makes it extremely hard. Um, the board of parole um, is made of, you know, ex-law enforcement. Um, they're not easy to come by. People go through the board, you know, three or four times before they get paroled. And so um, just that, um, it's, 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 a poly it's, it's a lot of training that people have to do. Um, a lot of psych evals that people have to go through, um, a lot of trauma that people have to bring up to just get past and get released. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, disrupting this pipeline will allow people to finally fight their cases from um, out south side. And so while people, um, you know, aside from like the people finally being able to hug their family members, people finally being able to be in community, people finally being able to hug their children, um, they can finally fight their cases um, outside and not in ICE detention. Um, and so this policy is extremely important because currently um, in the state of California, we're handing people over to ICE voluntarily. It's not a law, it's, um, it's not like, you know, an official policy, it's just something that you know, is precedent that they've been doing for a long time that they don't have to do, um, and yet they're still doing it, um, which is kind of ridiculous. And so we're trying to fight back and make this into, put it into law that they can't hand people over after they've earned release, um, no matter, you know, what their conviction is. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, you know, we've gotten over a 150 organizations across the state of California. Um, we've gotten several assembly members and senators endorsements and, you know, we still need that final push. And so unfortunately we didn't make it to the Senate floor for a final vote. Um, but, you know, we're hoping back in January, we can go back into the Senate floor in January um, to continue um, advocating for the Vision Act to finally pass it. So next question I do have is, uh, what has been the most challenging part of your work in supporting deported community members or those targeted for deportation? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the most challenging part is always working with families. Um, every time I have to work with a family, you know, when you're working with someone who is um, not being transferred not even like just incarcerated, but um, transferred to ICE and then maybe, and with the potential of them getting deported. Um, you're not just working with an individual, but you're working with a whole community of people. Um, you're working with their kids, you're working with their nieces and nephews, you're working with their elderly parents, their brothers and sisters. Um, and, and all that trauma is brought up again, over and over. Um, and I can tell you stories of like, um, when I first, um, like a story where um, I ran, we randomly found a, for a campaign that we are running um, for to, to stop drug transfers. Um, we found one of our members, family members off Twitter. <laughs> and so we drove to them uh, in Fresno um, and we had a meeting and we talked about it. Um, what the implications of having a public campaign would be, you know, um, how much they wanted to participate. And I think um, the hardest part of being there is, um, you know, not wanting to like over promise something um, and under delivering. Um, I think the most heartbreaking part of it is um, seeing a family wake up, um, you know, every day or getting ready to go to the gates, um, to hope that their 
you know, family member will come out the gate only to find out that their family member was turned over to ICE. Um, and I've been in more than, you know, more than one or two, three, four, five situations where I've had to sit at a gate with a family member, um, hoping that, you know, someone wasn't turned over to ICE, but instead someone was turned over to ICE. And so um, we've had to drive to the ICE, um, you know, the processing center uh, that, where the person might be and, you know, hope that that person is at a ICE facility that is close enough for the family to drive to. Um, in a lot of cases during the pandemic, so many of our members were flown out of state. And so um, that is the most challenging part is just to further see how much, how much more damage um, families are when, you know, this happens. Uh, thank you for answering that question. That was uh, definitely difficult work. Uh, this question I do as is conversely, uh, what is probably what is the most rewarding part of your work? Though? I think when um, when a family invites you to a house party uh, <laughs> because their family member is uh, home, mm -hmm. and I think uh, several times my favorite moments are. Um, either being invited to a house party or receiving a, um, a surprise video of um, someone coming home or someone surprising their family member that they're home um, and tears of joy are just like rushing through. Um, I think in my line of work, um, in the work that I do, there are very little wins. Um, but I think every little win that we do have, um, we really cherish them and every little win that we have. <laughs> Technical difficulties uh, sometimes happens. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think when, when folks are reunited with their families, that's the most rewarding. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I've gotten to see it a lot, um, but I feel like I don't get to see it enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is just like the con part of it. But um, the, you know, when I do get to see it, um, it really is the most magical thing. I can agree there. I have a family member actually a few years ago that was uh, released, although unfortunately I was unable to celebrate it because I was overseas, but it's in a video. So a question that I have from our audience is, how can prisoner uh, deportees or those targeted by ICE be civilly engaged in if they're are not U.S. citizens are lost voting rights due to uh, defranchisement and states that stop felons from voting? Well, they can't vote if they're deported. <laughs> uh, if they're deported, they can't vote uh, in the U.S. But I think if you're talking about how can they advocate for themselves, um, I mean, deportees can advocate for themselves. Back in 2016, um, there was a delegation of deportees who actually went to the Cambodian government and said that, you know, accepting deportees was harming them. Like they didn't, um, they had expressed to the government. And you can actually find this um, documentary online. Um, I have to follow up with y'all on what the documentary is called. It's a short documentary, but. Um, there is, used to be an organization called One Love Cambodia, um, where deportees in Phnom Penh organized. Um, and they eventually got a delegation of folks from the US and deportees to um, you know, gather re-entry support, but also talk about how Cambodia can be more proactive. They actually were successful momentarily in stopping deportations. Um, and it was a pretty powerful movement. And so I think, yeah, I think there are always ways to advocate um, for yourselves. Um, I think this is one example of it that um, unfortunately since um, One Love Movement, you know, has disbanded, but um, it, was, it was a huge thing back then. I mean, um, it's unfortunate because nothing is there to sustain it. Um, but I mean, I think I say this because, um, yeah, 
DPs uh, is what we call folks uh, who are deported DPs, um, you know, are extremely resilient people, especially folks in Cambodia. They've, they've um, you know, built re-entry groups for themselves. They've built communities. Um, it's kind of their own enclaves uh, to support each other. Um, and so I think this kind of speaks to the resiliency of, of you know, their conditions. I mean, um, they may not be accepted so easily, but I think it's kind of amazing. Um, some folks have started nonprofits. Some folks have started their own businesses and teaching English, and so. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I should think I've heard of the organization before, um, uh, before it disbanded, but you no, know, it's nice. It's amazing that, you know, this, you know, they still continuing to fight in. Hopefully, you know, hopefully it will be more, uh, uh, Hopefully it will continue on um, even despite the challenges that are going on with um, of course the pandemic and other and lockdowns. Yeah, but formerly incarcerated people in California can vote. Um, I just like wanted to be clear, Prop 17 did pass. And so if you are a US citizen, um, you know, and you're formally incarcerated, um, even with a felony conviction, you can vote. What can college students and recent graduates do to be uh, civically engaged or assist with movements? Yeah, I think um, I think there are a lot of ways, but I think um, one way is just to be um, present. And a, lo a lot of it's ways is like in this digital world, I feel like organizing has um, taken to like, a different level of, you know, call-ins, actions and tweeting actions and email actions and I encourage you all you know to try to schedule those in your time um, all throughout the United States especially there is a campaign for someone in your area um, to be released from prison to stop their deportation or to be pardoned um, and, and you know APSC while we're a small group in the Bay Area, we're an extension of a bigger movement that, um, you know, is adding on to work that has been there for a really long time. Um, and so I would, you know, while APSC focuses primarily on Southeast Asian folks, you know, I encourage folks to look into um, groups like um, Survived and Punished, the um, Immigrants Defense Project, um, you know, courage. There are so many other groups that do the same work, similar work, um, have the same values as APSC, um, run, run similar um, campaigns that aim to get someone free or bring freedom to someone's life. Um, so I encourage y'all, you know, it's extremely easy to sometimes it's just like, um, I used to just schedule a call in my phone, in my calendar um, every day. And it would take me five minutes just to call the governor's office. Um, and I just wanted to be able to practice that and do it consistently. Um, and even having that small practice allows us to, you know, remember, you know, the bit of that is like being a civically engaged person, right? It doesn't have to happen in these like big extravagant rallies, but, um, they definitely do help and they definitely do um, place a lot of pressure um, and they, they matter to someone and someone's community. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so I'm going to continue in the kind of same general area. Uh, how do you view working and cooperating with other organizations in Asian American and and Black, Indigenous, people of color, spacious. Yeah, um, yeah, I, and like I said, APSC is an extension of work that has already been, do, been done, is, is being done. Um, it, we're an extension of a movement um, to, you know, decarcerate, uh, to bring healing um, to the world. Um, and so I would say, um, you know, are, we try to be as intersectional as possible um, in our work. Um, 
And I think our, our work intrinsically uh, aims to do kind of in our own way uh, to decarcerate um, to decarcerate right? Like we, we go into prisons, um, we teach ethnic studies um, and we're trying to think of ways how to support folks, um, how to build re-entry plans for folks when they come home um, and strong re-entry plans. And so these are kind of the things that, you know, I think when we're thinking of, um, we often don't think of um, decarceration as like, like kind of this method of, of work, um, but um, sometimes it does take, you know, us being able to have to, to work within the system to try to pull people out, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, you know, even in our ethnic studies classes, um, we t actually teach, um, we teach ethnic studies. Um, and so a lot of our work um, is not just, um, Asian American based, um, but we teach, you know, um, like African American studies, um, Chicano Latino studies. Um, a lot of talking, we talk a lot about what does solidarity look like um, amongst our communities. Um, and again, um, you know, it, those that are incarcerated are primarily people of color. So, um, you know, not we do get folks that are um, black students. We do get Chicano students in our classes. Um, we do, you know, we get a lot of different people from walk, different walks of life um, in our classes. Um, and I think um, being able to have a framework to, um, to give space to those stories um, is, is how we give space to collaborating. Um, but yeah, again, I think, you know, again, APSC, it, our work is an extension of work that has already been done. It's pretty much inspired by um, a lot of, of Black movements, a lot of Indigenous movements to free people, to decarcerate. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I think that's the best I have for that. That's cool. That's, that is a good answer though. Thank you, thank you. All right, so no, we, I know you probably touched on a few things uh, before, but uh, aside from fundraising, are there other ways that uh, we can support your work? Yeah, I mean, uh, all of those people that I mentioned, um, the stories that I highlighted, um, the fam, pardons for the people, Unwing, um, and Ricky Chuan, uh, I would say um, take a time to look at those toolkits um, and, you know, just participate by either um, emailing or making a call um, to advocate for either their pardons or their immediate releases. Um, so most of these people, actually all of these people that are listed are, are seeking pardon. Um, most of these people are home with the exception of Fee who's currently in ICE. Um, and so yeah, if folks can, like I would encourage y'all to just schedule some time um, take you know 20 minutes out of your day to craft up an email or even if you have you're limited on time um, take five minutes and call um, the office of a governor um, and advocate um, for clemency to be granted to these people um, who desperately need it to be reunited with their families okay thank you and I guess our question our Last question is, um, how can UNASA constituents, and I can't say that word, how can UNASA constituents specifically get involved with uh, supporting APSC? Yeah, uh, <laughs> like I said, um, all of the campaigns um, that we're doing right now, um, be fam, pardons for the people, um, when we, if you're in California and you feel very passionate about policy and policy change, um, you know, um, we'll start doing Vision Act ad advocacy back in January. And so if you wanna know more about it, you're more than welcome to email me um, and I'll give my email to somebody to pass on. Um, uh, but 
overall, like I just want to name um, APSC is just like a small group that, you know, we're like a small staff group in Oakland um, and that, you know, we, we do the work, uh, we, we do, I want to say, I don't want to think of our work as small, but, um, you know, we have the capacity to do one or two campaigns every so often. Um, and so I highly encourage y'all to also look into just not APSC, um, because APSC is, again, an extension of the movement. Uh, right, we're an extension of this movement to decarcerate, to create healing, to create love. Um, so I encourage y'all to look into other organizations as well that um, pretty much um, you know align with us. So I encourage y'all to look into Survived and Punished, an organization that um, works with uh, criminalized survivors. Um, they often do, um, you know, drop LWAP coalition. Um, uh, California Coalition for Women's Prisoners. Um, you know, I'm sorry, most of the organizations I know are California based. Um, Interfaith, if you're a faith based, um, Interfaith for Human Integrity is an awesome faith based organization that does amazing work. Um, and so, yeah, there, I can give you lots of recommendations of you know, additional orgs to also look after because, you know, again, APSC, um, while we like love and, and would appreciate if you can support us in any of these campaigns uh, for fee, for um, any of those folks who are seeking pardon, for um, for Ricky, um, there are also so many other organizations that are doing the same work um, in different areas. And so if you're looking for something that's closer to you, um, maybe an organization that's more aligned with a specific group, like working with survivors. Um, I can definitely make those recommendations. Um, but again, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say like, um, yeah, please engage with any of these campaigns um, because I think uh, the, the quicker that we can get folks home, the quicker that, um, you know, we can really show the world uh, how re-entry and how community should be built, right? Like, um, you know, more than half of our staff for a while was uh, formerly incarcerated juvenile lifers. I pretty much surround myself with people who have these lived experiences of being incarcerated um, with like for over a hundred years in accumulation, almost over 200 years in accumulation. Uh, and I get to learn so much. Um, and I think it says a lot about the community that we can build. So um, yeah, I would say like participate in the campaigns, um, bring folks home. I do want to thank you and APSC for being with us and thank you for sharing the organization work, sharing the stories and those you are fighting for. Uh, I also want to thank Nicole and Charlie for assisting me today with this webinar. Now, before we, uh, before we end for today, uh, we want to give a quick plug to the rest of the events that are happening for VA Advocacy Week. So tomorrow we will be hosting a abolition teaching with facilitators from Abolition Action, New York City, and NYC DSA, where no previous knowledge of the prison industrial complex or police abolition is required to attend and learn. And on Wednesday, we'll be closing out with a community care session where participants will get a chance to meet new people, process, and work out zines while enjoying beverages of their choice. APSC will be hosting their own webinar on Thursday, September 23rd at 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you're interested, we will drop the link in the chat. Again, thank you so much, Yen. Yen. Uh, and thank you so far. And thank you, everybody, for coming today. Have a good night, and we hope to see you for day two and three. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, y'all. Please come to um, the, the, the survey thing. Um, I had to process quite a bit of mail for this, um, almost over 500 surveys. So please come to it. <laughs> That's a lot of mail. <laughs>